Yes, I can. study session on the British Council, we put you through a multi-site um, sort of chain of migration route to we did that with our partner Ipswich. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, a bit of background, we met the British Council at a breakfast event we did in uh, early last year. So we had 40 architects um, come to uh, the Ivy Rectum in London uh, with another partner. We talked to them about uh, the path, the platform, what other customers were experiencing, how it was improving the development process, consistency between designers, automating collective uh, DevOps processes, and uh, continuous delivery, and how all that rolled into continuous delivery. Uh, and the British Council seemed fairly impressed with that. They subsequently uh, released an RFP for a container-based PaaS, um, which Ixis did. Ixis were and still are an, an incumbent supplier of infrastructure and support services to the British Council. Uh, so we teamed up with Ixis uh, and we did a platform uh, and we won. And <coughs> we then promptly started the migration work. It happened very quickly. Um, within the first three months, we'd gone through the planning exercise and started migrating sites from this Drupal multi site, 130 countries onto containers and platforms. Um, so, who have we got speaking today? Um, there's Nick Morgalla, who actually has been backed up by Alexi, who we got on the phone. Um, Nick was meant to be here, he's got laryngitis, uh, so he's not turned up. Um, but we've got this phone connection, we've got Alexi hopefully standing in for Nick. Uh, and then we've got Mike Carter, who's the technical director for ITSIS, and he's going to talk about the, some of the project work and the things they did and getting this thing implemented in conjunction with the, um, the British Council team. And we've got Rob Douglas, who some of you may know, he's our VP of Customer Experience, and he's going to mop up towards the end and talk about next steps and what could be and roadmap and exciting things all day. Um, so with that, I think I'll hand over to, to Nick and or Alexi. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I don't think Nick is with us because, uh, as you mentioned, he's got laryngitis. So Nick, just to give some context, Nick is um, our head of ops. Um, and yeah, these are actually his slides, which I'm going to be talking to. Um, and I look after the development team and the product team in, in the digital department of, of the British Council. And um, a bit of background, the British Council, uh, if you go to the next slide, is uh, yeah, basically who we are. Um, it was, British Council was founded in 1934, and basically we're, we're here to promote social, cultural, and educational opportunities um, between uh, people of the UK and the wider world, essentially. Um, if we pop to the next slide, um, the work we do is, uh, I can't control this, can you, can you next slide, uh, is, is, um, we do three main areas of work, we work um, in English learning, um, and that includes um, providing courses, um, and uh, examinations, and teaching materials, um, and also we use this expertise in education to help transform uh, national educational systems around the world, and we also work in the arts, promoting um, UK arts internationally and also encouraging arts projects and artists around the world. So it's a very uh, international um, business we're in. Um, and if we skip to the next slide, um, uh, we're present in over 100 countries. I think it's about 116 country sites we're in. Um, um, so just to give you a sense of the scale of, of what we needed to, to achieve. Um, most of our sites offer content in languages other than English as well. I think we support, it says more than 40, I think it's about 50 languages that we're also supporting across our, our different sites. Um, so in addition to what we call our, our country sites, which are basically promoting those activities or, or, or um, uh, raising awareness of those activities I spoke about previously across all those hundred and something countries, we also create what we call these white label sites, which are uh, effectively um, uh, 
uh, a site using our CMS, which isn't branded in the same way and might have a particular reason um, for being a, a, a recent example has been Shakespeare Lib one, which was um, one of our bigger white label sites, and that was, as you probably can guess, celebrated the 400 years since um, Shakespeare's death. Uh, the purpose is Drupal 7, so we are looking at moving Drupal 8. Uh, the team here, it's, it's an agile team, and we deploy well, pretty much every week, or regularly every week we, we put out deployment. Um, and presently our focus is with uh, e-commerce and building in um, e-commerce functionality into those websites. Uh, next slide. So uh, what keeps, well, keeps Nick awake, really? Um, I guess first thing is around security, data protection, legal. Um, it's ensuring that the sites are secure. Obviously, we don't uh, need to obviously avoid all the obvious risks around that. Um, and also, we have data protection obligations um, around the um, European Union uh, expectations and, and rules around that. Um, so we also need to be hosting within the EU, or at least the European Economic Area. Um, we have. Uh, an expectation that all our sites are going to load in under two seconds. Um, and obviously, we need to minimize any downtimes, any downtime, um, particularly around deploy um, and any other kind of central activity. And effectively, essentially, just want to keep the development pipeline flowing and not um, distract our teams from, from, from just getting you know, the stories out the door. So, uh, if we skip to the next one, the reasons why we were looking to, to change was. Um, our previous hosting uh, setup was, was a you know, traditional data center model. Uh, it was basically one large cluster that served all our sites, um, one Drupal built instance that served all our sites. Um, and that probably wasn't, well, wasn't working to us, working for us where we wanted it to. We needed to improve performance and reliability. Um, our deploys were killing us, we were, our downtime was in the hours. Um, when we were putting out deploys each week, so it was, it was a huge overhead in terms of how much downtime we had. Um, and, and also we had a lot of effort being put into trying to fix deploy issues, um, uh, as opposed to letting the developers get on and, and do what we needed them to do. Um, so obviously that was a, a, an unwanted cost for the business in that area too. So when we, uh, can you next slide on that one, please? Um, when we came to look at what we should do next, there were a number of considerations and, and requirements. Um, we were looking for a, an SME service provider, um, ideally hosted on, uh, procured by G Cloud. That was something that was encouraged to us by, by the UK government as well. Um, and we saw that as a, uh, and also wanted to look at using a container uh, based model for, for hosting our sites. Uh, we, Felt that that would help us achieve high, high availability in you know, a predictable environment and, and improve our reliability. Um, and it also uh, was aligned better with our, our own development um, workflows and processes. Uh, we needed to integrate with Git, um, and we also had a view to adding the e commerce components, as we mentioned. So, we, um, so that was obviously a requirement. Uh, service management, we obviously needed that to work with our internal processes and also to conform with uh, our security and data protection requirements, as mentioned. Okay, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, yep, great. Um, so, uh, what we've come up with, it's uh, in the workflow you can see on the left there, um, how, you know, the way the, our repo and our hosting instances and our testing environments all work together. Uh, basically, this fit, fit, fitted very, very well with the workflow we, we, if we didn't have, at least we probably wanted to have. Um, it certainly enabled um, multi, more multi-branch testing, which we were kind of lacking beforehand that we really wanted and something now that we really depend on quite heavily. Um, so, so in terms of a, a structure or process, it really suited us the way that we've got things working. So we're very happy with that. Um, also, as you can see on the right, there's a little image there around uh, Akamai effectively being our CDN. Uh, happily, the platform .sh components uh, integrated really well with Akamai, so that's, that all worked. 
Um, and the image on the bottom right uh, basically goes to, to illustrate how we've uh, so effectively each one of our sites is, is a container, is a project um, on, the, on the platform environment. Um, and, uh, and we have different types of sites, as I mentioned. We have our country sites, our .org is our, our, is our UK facing site. We have our, our white label site. So they each can share components between them as required or, or be discrete as, as needed. Um, so that's gives some way of how things have been set up uh, on a site basis, on the container basis. Um, if we go to the next slide on migration, the, the project was it, was, it was, it was very rapid. I mean, certainly by our standards, it was a very rapid project. Um, it was, took us three months from the beginning to end of the, of the migration to move over the 100 plus sites we had. Um, we began a bit before that, obviously doing some proof of concept, um, establishing what that process would be, um, coming up with, you know, issues before we went to the real migration and, uh, as an experience here shaking out any problems. Um, but when we did get going, uh, it all was done within three months. Uh, and the process was very collaborative. Um, and as it mentioned here, we made great use of online tools. We're, we're quite disparate um, geographically, um, certainly within ourselves at British Council, but also ICSIS um, and, and the platform at SH, which was spread around the globe. So, um, so that was no barrier as well. We worked really well in that sense. Um, and yeah, and we delivered it within budget um, and uh, in September 2015, it said here. So that was quite, quite a boon to get that, that done um, as per the plan um, in, in what I feel was a very rapid migration. Uh, to the next slide, the results. Um, so yes, yeah, so we've seen um, immediate improvements, to be honest, um, site performance. Um, 30-40% reduction in load times. The, the downtime for deploys was, was um, slashed, frankly. You can see that from four to six hours down to one and a half, including the testing, um, which has been a massive um, improvement to, to, for our department and also for the wider business. Um, and the improvement has definitely improved. Sorry, the liability has definitely improved as well. Um, and as mentioned, uh, you know, our developers can go back to developing as opposed to trying to troubleshoot issues with deploys and the like. Um, next slide. Ah, okay, yes. So, um, all in all, um, not only were we pleased, but um, this is the project, the migration, the, the planning of it all, and, and, the, and, the, and the solution itself um, was actually won, won the Real IT Award. Um, yeah, so uh, I can't exactly remember what the exact category was now. Maybe someone else does was there. But um, yes, yeah, so it was definitely recognised by the industry as well. So that was uh, very heartening to see. Um, okay, and that's, I think that's pretty much the slides that I had prepared. Right, great. Okay, thanks, Alexi. Appreciate that. Um, and appreciate you dialing in. Thanks very much. Please, you know, continue. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask okay. Mike Carter to come up now. Okay. Okay. As um, Kieran said, I'm Mike Carter from uh, Ixis and technical director. I'm going to give a bit more of a, a background of the technical uh, achievements that we wrapped around platform services uh, to meet the British Council's um, requirements. So I'm going to cover a bit of how we re-architectured uh, with the British Council's digital team their Git repositories to fit with the way platform um, worked and remove them from being a, a single multi-site. I'm going to cover a bit about the uh, challenge of deploying 116 and now 125 sites all at a uh, single click. Um, a bit about how we achieved a good way of doing backups and data synchronization. And, um, and I can also cover a bit of the automation that we did using the platform API, uh, including a bit about the, how we're doing monitoring. Um, and then the service that we provide every month to the British Council um, as it exists. So um, as was mentioned slightly earlier, uh, the original way that the uh, British Council's uh, development team had structured their uh, project was based on a single 
Drupal installation with every country as a separate multi-site installation. Um, the downside of that was that every time one of the country sites needed to be uh, amended and deployed, it had to deploy every single country site and then run things like features reverts, um, cache clears for every single site, which resulted in a huge uh, delay of around four hours, I think, every time they wanted to, to uh, deploy just a single change to a site. It was all or nothing. Um, as part of the migration process, we worked with the British Council team to split up the uh, single Git repository, moved a lot of the code into a, an installation profile, which they codenamed Solas, um, and then each of the individual countries that were under the original multi-site were moved into individual Git repositories that lived on the platform um, system. And then every time you commit to those uh, smaller repositories, it would redeploy and build the site. Um, as part of this, we then created um, the Drush makefile for every country. Um, this was based off a, a templated makefile that we can pull in um, so that it's easy to update across all the 116 sites should um, a change be needed. So deployments. Um, the British Council said they needed a robust, reliable and non-disruptive uh, one-click deployment process. And when you've got hundreds of sites, um, doing the traditional way of deploying one at a time isn't really uh, acceptable. And as Alexi mentioned, they do a deployment every Monday, um, usually without fail, and they need it to work. Uh, so part of the um, deployment process also involved uh, deploying the, any changes to the platform app YAML um, configuration files. Uh, so we had to come up with a way of managing these from a central place and then deploying them out to every uh, individual country repository to uh, basically remove a lot of the headache and time wasted for the support team. To solve a lot of the uh, requirements, we built a dashboard using a bit of software called Rundeck. Um, that provided a, a web interface for the Ixis support team and also the developers at British Council so that they could pick either a single site to deploy or a group of um, projects or all of them at once and deploy it to uh, production. Um, part of this was uh, involving a lot of um, custom scripts that were written. Uh, they combined a lot of the uh, boiler template configuration files, the platform app YAML I mentioned, um, also the make file, um, a root YAML file, which was a, a big task of getting all the redirects in, and uh, a changelog file. So every time they deploy a site, we're combining all these files together and putting them into each Git repository for a country. Um, the reason being is that we have to commit something to the platform's country files, uh, country repositories, so that it will trigger a deployment. Um, we use platform's variable system as well to store custom bits of information for each project, and then during the deployment and the build process, we pull out the variable information. Um, we're currently using that for disk size, for storage. We pull that out and then insert it into the generic platform app YAML file. Um, it made it a lot easier for us to keep the platform file with the um, other things like PHP versions and whitelists, uh, generic and easy to maintain. Um, this reduced, oh, and as part of the deployment process as well, we started off by doing the deployments one after another, and we soon found out that took a long, long time to get through 116 sites. So we started at 10 a.m. on a Monday. Um, it was a good few hours uh, it was past lunchtime. So what we did was take um, all of the projects that were part of the group and split them up into batches of, I think it was either six or 10, and we used a, a parallel execution process that we could run lots of the deployments in, in parallel and get through the uh, deployments a lot quicker. So we reduced it from, as I say there, four hours down to 35 minutes, um, and that was to get all the sites done, but not um, taking any of the sites offline. Um, and it rippled through the batches of 10 at a time up to the current 126 I think we've got at the moment. Uh, similar requirement, oh, similar um, things we had to do was the backups. They required, British Council required daily backups to be taken across all 116 sites. As well as backing up the data, they needed to synchronize the data back from the production environments to uh, their testing and QA uh, staging environments as well so that the same content that the editors were creating would be uh, available for running tests against. Um, 
when we first started out, we were doing serial uh, one after another backups, which took eight hours to complete on the original 116 sites, just because the different size storage um, database sizes, sometimes it took longer to, uh, to finish. Um, we also had the data syncing um, from the production environment, and we created an intermediary environment so that we could then not keep the production site locked for longer than it needs to be. And then we synced data from the intermediary ones to the QA environment and to the staging environment in the background, uh, leaving the production sites to carry on working. Um, as we did with the deployment, we implemented a parallel batch process. I think we used GNU something semaphore, parallel semaphore tool, I think it was. Um, and that allowed us to run after a bit of testing. I think we got it to the sweet spot of about six jobs at a time. Um, to run the backups, and this decreased from the eight hours backup and synchronization down to a much nicer three hours. Um, at the end of the three hours, we then ran some scripts which used the API to, to check to make sure all the backups had finished and um, date stamped. Which brings me on to the platform API and automation um, bits of work we did. These are uh, uh, lots of glue scripts um, and bits to, to do other uh, useful housekeeping on the platform. Um, as I mentioned, we use Rundex to execute a lot of these scripts, and we provided uh, separate buttons and interfaces to run these scripts and get the output so that different people would be able to um, monitor the, uh, the platform. Um, as I mentioned, parallel uh, processing, that could be uh, calling the platform CLI tool to do the data backups and the data synchronizations. We also uh, used the previously mentioned platform variables process again for storing other uh, configuration data and then injecting it into the configuration files. Um, we also created a way to group um, the projects. I think in one of the diagrams that Alexi showed earlier, they've got the white label sites, the main .org sites, and then the 116 country sites. So we've created a way where you can group them using the platform variables uh, data so that we can then just target the deployment of only um, certain types of sites or a subset of the sites, which we're eventually going to be um, looking to do different time zone uh, dependent deployments so that we're never going to be blocking um, different countries during their daytime. Um, one of the last things we were doing with the, the API was um, setting up a way of monitoring. So the British Council had um, SLAs we had to meet, and we needed to prove that we were meeting them um, externally. So they were also monitoring, and we had to uh, provide our own monitoring for this. Uh, we opted for a tool called NodePing, um, which is similar to Pingdom, but was a lot more cost effective at large numbers of uh, sites. They had a great API, so um, one of our other tasks was to take all the data from NodePing, combine that with the platform API's data about each project and the project sizes standard large um, mediums. And then we combine all that data together to produce a number of reports that were accessible through the dashboard. This was allowing us to see if um, some sites that were maybe on a medium size uh, platform uh, were performing bad and needed to be upgraded. Uh, it also allowed us to see things like um, uh, availability of sites, if any of the sites were going down, maybe from a traffic spike from promotion or marketing. Um, we also produced some reports that did just a, a standard audit of all the projects, the total environments that each project's got, the s disk size for each one, um, and a few other bits of data. Then we could run that and put that into the uh, service review reports, which we offered as part of the sort of wraparound service um, that the British Council required that we had to fit into their existing support workflows and be their single point of contact. So this is one of Ixis's main services. We provided uh, an ITIL-led service desk with a dedicated team. Uh, we integrated into the British Council's global service desk, um, the ServiceNow software, and we became a resolver group for all the Solas uh, support issues, whether that was application or infrastructure. And then we triaged those um, as needed uh, through to platform support service. Um, this included change, incident, problem, and capacity management issues, uh, things like uh, release management on a Monday uh, morning as well. Um, as I mentioned, every month we do service reporting and service reviews. 
with the client and a lot of the data that we pulled out of the APIs um, was then put into the service reports, um, prettied up with graphs, um, made easier to digest. Uh, and part of the monitoring integration also included a bit of pager duty uh, integration for out of hours alerting should any of the sites go down for longer than a few minutes. And that is my technical coverage. Right, so then I'll pick it up from there. I'm Robert uh, Douglas from Platform. And I wanted to explain just a couple of the concepts that Mike introduced from the platform side, and then go on to show you uh, some of the things that we'd expect uh, the British Council to benefit from in the uh, near future, some uh, new platform developments. So um, one, I wanted to explain just the concept of deployment on platform altogether, because uh, it's, uh, it means different things depending on what context you're talking in. Um, if you're doing a multi-site deployment as British Council were before, then uh, it's basically replacing the code and then going through all of the existing sites that you've got on there and running the update scripts. And one of the inherent problems of doing that is that uh, you've got a quite long stretch of time where the consistency between the code and the databases uh, of these various sites is not good. So if you need to do an, a database schema update uh, to install a new module, for example, or uh, maybe a module is adding an index or a new column in the database, then the 136th site has to wait for all of the previous sites to do their updates before it does its update. That means that that entire time it's running code that is not uh, working with the database. So there, there's a disparity. Now that could be either completely invisible, depending on what the change is, or it could be catastrophic. If the data, if the code's telling the site to look in a, into a column that doesn't exist, that's a, P, that's a fatal error on the site the entire time. And there was basically no way to get around that. Um, so that was one of the I original impetus for moving off of multi-site and splitting the sites into individual sites. So when Ixis then took O that over and put it onto platform, uh, they took advantage of a couple of nice tricks that platform can do. First of all, uh, platform didn't expect necessarily that all of the code would be put into the Git repository, but rather platform looks first of all to see if there's anything like a uh, project make file or drush make. And if it is, if, if there is one, then platform uh, builds that. So. Um, it, there's a phase where, what we call the build phase, where it's looking at the code that you commit, and it's trying to figure out how you want to build your site, whether it's a composer JSON type of build, or in, in, in other technologies like NPM for Node, or PIP, or RubyGems, and gets all the code that you want, including a Drush make, builds that, and then it moves it into place, and then it, you can do things like your um, updates. So Ixis took advantage of the project make build strategy, and they were able then to, instead of, when they want to update a module, instead of putting the code for that module into a repository and making sure all the files are updated and any old files that uh, don't exist are taken out, they just update the number in the drush make file from you know, one minor point release to another. So they would literally say views module 6.2 to 6.3. And that automatically has the consequence of updating views on all 136 of their sites because they're all being built by Drush Make. And the same would work with Composer. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to explain. Uh, another thing that Mike talked about that uh, might have been foreign to you if you're not familiar with platform is the concept of a, a platform app YAML file. So YAML, of course, is just the, the format that it's in. But what does a platform app YAML file do? It describes an application on platform. Uh, platform has the concept that for any given project, you can have many applications. Uh, imagine a Drupal site that has a Magento uh, e-commerce site built into it and uh, maybe a Node.js application for chat, all working together as one website. Plat platform can do all three of those things in one package but each one of those different applications needs a platform app YAML file that describes the individual application. 
what does it describe? It describes what language it's in, so PHP. What version of that language you need? PHP 5.6, 5.4, 5.7, hip hop PM. It describes things like what uh, writable mount points the web server needs. So Drupal needs temp files, private files, public files, things like that. Uh, and some website configuration. Uh, you describe the build uh, and deploy scripts that you need to run. Uh, and it, it, it's a very uh, powerful file that shapes the application. So uh, what Ixis did was find a way to manage 136 of those that have light variations on each other depending on the exact individual site, but which have a lot of commonality between them. So they're all running the same PHP version. They all have the same mount points uh, and things like that. So that was one of the, the, the magic tasks that Ixis figured out. Okay, so those, those were the two concepts that I wanted to explain from, uh, from Mike's bit. Um, just in terms of what that means on the platform side. And now I want to tell you a few of the things where I think that if we were to do this case study again next year, uh, you would be able to see some of the advances that the uh, British Council has been able to make based on new things that are coming on platform. Uh, oh, um, oh. <laughs> I, I didn't catch your bullet point, so I, I thought you were going to just breeze through. Oh, you didn't. You <laughs> didn't actually get them. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, can we get them to the the, the Google Doc then? <laughs> sorry, sorry, my mistake. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> No worries, they're there. Is it Windows or is it reinstalled? I'm not sure. I never know. <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> right. So, um, well, while that's loading, just out of curiosity, who here has actually used Platform before in any context? Great, so most of you are new. That's, that's cool. Uh, we're doing demos downstairs on the trade floor. Um, so if, if you have questions about Platform after this, then please come down and do get a demo. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot that we could talk about that I'm not mentioning here. Okay, so I can just load any time now. Hmm. Well, I'll jump ahead. I know my slides well enough that I can speak without them. They're oh, they're coming, yeah. Definitely Windows. Yeah, it has nothing to do with Windows this time. So one of the first things that um, I expect, and I've, I've, I've confirmed this with Mike, is that um, the British Council will eventually take care, uh, take advantage of PHP 7. Uh, platform was, in fact, one of the first uh, platform as a services uh, overall to offer PHP 7 uh, to anybody who wanted it. Sorry, there should be those slides. Those are yours? Uh -huh. There we go. And where does it view? I can barely read this. <laughs> Can't do that. Wow, that was painful. But here we are. <laughs> Sorry about that thing hanging over on the side. We're just not going to worry about that. Okay, so back up. Uh, a couple things that I think that the British Council will benefit from 
um, uh, will be the move to Drupal 8. So they've already planned that, but uh, aside from the known benefits of moving to Drupal 8, there's some really cool things you can do with platform, which are pretty exciting. Um, first and foremost, uh, they'll be able to build Drupal 8 with Composer. So platform is um, able to take a Composer JSON file and on the basis of that, build your Drupal site. And that's really nice. If you're not a developer and if you've not worked with Composer directly, it means that when I want to install a new module, for example, I simply type Composer, require views module. And then I commit that file that it just generated, the Composer file, to Git, and Platform builds Drupal with the views module, just because I've done that. It's, it's brilliantly simple. Platform can also help you build that locally so that uh, it's uh, an e easy experience as a l on your laptop to do the development that you need to do um, on that. So I just in, in, in included a little bit of Composer JSON from um, one of uh, Platform's uh, starting points for Drupal 8 to, for, so you could see what that would look like. So there's you know Core coming in at Drupal 8 and Drush coming in and the Drupal console tool coming in, stuff that developers would really want to have and extending that's also then very easy. Uh, another thing uh, that isn't uh, necessarily strictly for uh, platform specific, but that we, um, when we work with customers who are not the British Council, uh, in this case we, but are using Drupal 8, we really promote the, um, the value of using Drupal's cache tags uh, along with a CDN that is compliant with cache tags. So that makes it so that you can invalidate cache in a very granular way, such as um, a specific view that you want to cache, or um, a block, or all of the uh, content that's been authored by a specific user, or content that's been authored on a specific date. You can invalidate that cache with an, without invalidating the cache for the whole site. And that makes it much more efficient than to rebuild just that cache. And it goes very fast on, on the Fastly CDN. Uh, and that the, the combination of Drupal 8 platform and Fastly in that case is, is really quite excellent. So um, there will be some nice things um, performance-wise. Wow, OK, good. Uh, another thing that the British Council is really looking forward to, and they've basically been chomping at the bit for us to deploy this so they can use it. Um, <coughs> I get sometimes daily uh, questions. Is it ready yet? Is it ready re yet? And I see some people smiling in the audience because they know they're the guilty <laughs> ones asking the question. And we're saying, OK, it's coming soon. But it's actually now um, really uh, almost there. And that is um, platforms always had a high availability website. We call that our enterprise plan but that was totally overkill to do 136 times for British Council. It the cost would have been enormous, okay? Uh, our list price for those is like 8,000 a year per site. So that would have just like knocked their budget uh, out, of, out of the universe. Um, what we're going to soon be able to do is offer high availability sites with redundancies at a much lower price range and that's a very exciting development for us. That means that even if you're running um, a smaller site, you'll still be able to choose the redundancy model that you have. Uh, for example, we work with uh, several redundancy models. Our favorite is master, 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 where you've got databases or solar search or caches that have three redundancies. Um, that stems back to something from computer science called the CAP theorem about making sure that your data is safe if something fails. And you need three copies of that to do it, and we adhere to that. But we'll also be able to do master-slave and some of the more um, lower cost, more traditional ways of replicating. And that'll give people a lot of options so that they can really choose their level of redundancy um, and the price point that they're willing to pay um, at a very granular level, and everybody will be able to meet their needs very specifically. Uh, and we'll be rolling that out um, to the British Council site within you know, the next months um, in a way that they can you know, start utilizing that. Um, right there, there's the one about PHP 7 that I was talking about. Um, so Platform has 
very long been uh, able to run PHP 7, also HipHop VM, which is the uh, virtual machine for PHP that Facebook runs, which is why Facebook can run PHP and be really fast. Um, we support both of those, and, and the British Council is currently on 5.4 PHP, so they're going to get a big boost just by testing out and switching to PHP 7. On platform, that's really easy for them. Um, they will literally update one line in their platform app YAML file and then roll that out to all 136 sites. And when they redeploy with that change in the app YAML file, it switches from PHP 5.4 to PHP 5.7 on the deploy. And if it doesn't work for some reason and they discover at the last minute an error that they've never seen before, they can change it back and push it and roll it back because uh, the concept of platform is to manage the code the data and the infrastructure all together, and you can roll back your infrastructure the way that you'd roll back your code. Uh, next. So an another pain point that not only the British Council have been voicing, but also a lot of our other customers is that there's simply um, not enough customer-facing monitoring. Now, we monitor everything internally, but we've um, We've taken a long time rolling out uh, real robust customer-facing monitoring, and we're attacking that from two fronts, and I know that they're, as a customer they're looking forward to that. Um, we're going to deploy um, something, either New Relic or something like it, uh, in the near future um, to, every, to every customer, and we're also building our own metrics and analytics uh, and logging framework that will be API-driven and customer-facing. So that, that would integrate with external tools, um, as well as giving you a lot of the metrics that are currently missing that are, you can get data out of platform, but it's sometimes harder than customers uh, were expecting. And we completely acknowledge that and are addressing that. And British Council is really looking forward to that feature as well, or at least Ixis is, because they're the ones doing the operations for it. Um, that would be very helpful for Ixis and a lot of the reporting that they're doing that they're on the line to do, that they're required to do, will also become simpler for them at that point. Um, and you know, we're really happy to see uh, British Council moving into e-commerce, uh, and we're working with them making a plan for those sites. Um, and their current needs are wholly met with Drupal, but uh, it's worth mentioning that should their future needs for technology move beyond Drupal or even beyond PHP applications, um, then those are all supported completely on platform and they don't have to worry about um, being locked into a, a CMS technology or a, a, a programming language technology just based on their platform as a service choice. So they'd be able to run other PHP applications like Symfony or Magento, or if they needed to run Node.js, Ruby, Python applications, uh, those are available as well. Um, and we see a, a lot of customers, other customers, who take advantage of that diversity to put together really uh, complex microservice-oriented uh, applications that are very modern, um, where the deployment and DevOps regime for each application is the same because they're all standardized then on platform. Yeah, so that was everything that I have to show. Um, I, how much time do we have? Uh, another 15 minutes. Oh, well, then we hopefully you've got just a ton of questions. <laughs> Who's first? There's a microphone over there. Um, if we can either pass it around or if you have the question, just walk right up to it and blurt it out. That has the great advantage for the people who watch the session later that it's recorded. Um, if not, then I'll just repeat the question and it'll go through my microphone. This is Oh, okay. Right. Who wants to be first? Yes, sir. So we, um, do you want to repeat the question? Sure. So um, the, the long and the short of the question was, how did platform help you? How, how did platform hinder you? So, um, go, go ahead. Answer frankly. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. 
I'll sure. catch you later. <laughs> yeah. I've got the uh, mic here. But yeah, so the, uh, we, we provided the hosting um, previously for uh, the British Council. I think, as uh, Alexi mentioned, it was a more of a traditional um, setup. And when they came out with a, a, a new tender of requirements, they specifically put container based hosting. Although we'd been playing around with um, things like Docker internally, we weren't confident enough to be using that um, on a production site of a client. So I think platform was really the only option um, uh, within the EU at the time. And um, they'd seen the demos already, the dev team at British Council. I think the, the challenges for, for Ixis is moving the client onto a platform. Um, I think we did the proof of con concept um, early on. and the differences between standard and enterprise at the time were, were quite different and trying to migrate 116 sites was a lot of different steps and process and some of them were manual, some of them were um, straightforward through the, uh, the CLI tool. And I think the, the British Council decided they didn't like the two different ways of doing things um, because they wanted to be able to hand it over to their service desk to carry on managing it when they brought new sites on later on. So um, I think about a month in we made a decision to knock enterprise on its head at the time, and then wait for the, the new um, integration to, to be deployed. Um, other problems at the time? I um, can't think of any massive ones that are There were some platform that problems that were revealed by the way that you were using platform. We I had never had a customer yeah. who deployed all 130 sites at once. And we, um, we did find some limitations of our system that we had to work yeah. around. And likewise for backups, which is how we ended up working out the sweet spot of how many backups you could actually execute at the same time without killing the, uh, the platform. Um, yeah, we've got there now, and it's, it's been running smoothly now for, what, nine months, I think, at least, after we've got through all the little bumpy bits. But. Can I follow that up, Ed? Please. Well, hopefully responsive enough to call the project successful, but I think that um, there were definitely challenges in terms of uh, we were trying something that was new for both of us, and once in a while we were running up against uh, engineering challenges where, um, as a product company, uh, the engineering team is not dedicated to this project, so then you have to make a change request that goes into the engineering queue and comes back out the other side sometime later. And so, because we were doing some things that were non-standard and uh, non-conformant with the main product stream, uh, I think that that did lead to some delays in uh, satisfying some of you know Ixus's pain points along the way. Um, and there were definitely uh, moments where there was some tension because of that. So I'll be quite you know, frank about that, but we did get through them all. Mm. One of the examples was the, the root YAML configuration. Um, they had some pretty complex regular expression uh, redirects that were being moved over from Apache's um, setup and we wanted to get them to work the same way using platform systems. So I think we got some engineering. I don't know how long it took, but we got it done. And as um, British Council said, we got the project all finished bang on time, even with these delays and um, challenges for both of us. Yes, sir? Hello. Uh, you oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that you are doing um, regular backups. So can you elaborate more on uh, how, for example, the amount of data or whether there is a mention or not or resources and backups? Um, so from the side where Ixis have set up Rundeck, we execute a job every night, which basically just calls um, platforms uh, CLI tool to do a snapshot. Um, how that works, I don't know if you want to fill the gaps there in, but right. so we do it 10 at a time. So what snapshots then is everything that's persistent on the disk, so then they get a consistent version of the site, including you know the database, the uploaded files, and solar all is one. Um, one unit that can be restored. Um, the underlying technologies do incremental diff-based, uh, you know, snapshotting. So the storage uh, aspects of that should be very efficient. But that's more of a cost of goods question for us rather than something that's customer-facing. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, let's, let's jump back here, and I'll, re I'll just repeat the question. Go ahead. Um, so the question, if I understood it perfectly correctly, was could we do a before and after comparison of the resources that are needed to run these sites and, availability. and the availability? So um, let's talk about the availability first. I, I think that it's not a fair comparison and that you wouldn't be compar comparing a multi-site to a container approach in that case. I think that you'd be comparing um, a very problematic previous hosting experience that had um, system systemic failures that were causing site downtime that had nothing to do with the site itself, plus a deployment process that took the site offline for four hours. <laughs> so it's a, it's a little hard to compare because those two elements of the downtime have been removed. So it's a, a much more stable um, situation altogether and the deployments are a lot um, shorter. So um, I think that's a little bit hard to do. In terms of the overall um, server outlay, I'd expect that we use more server resources than it previously did, but that's because we offer a lot more functionality and we take not only the production running of the sites, but also an extremely flexible development workflow where you can create a new copy of the site on the fly with all the services and all the data running and start developing on it, and then in an organized way, merge that into your workflow. Um, and, and, and that's a completely different product. So I think that you know, that overhead alone introduces more server resource. So it becomes a little bit hard to compare um, exactly what the difference is because the scope changed significantly. regarding platform, um, how do you compare yourself or your services uh, regarding to, uh, against uh, Docker? Uh, at least regarding uh, performance, scalability, or uh, maintainability in general? Well, that's a really hard question because you have to pick it apart a little bit to actually know what you're trying to compare. So. Yes, we use a containerization technology underneath it, but our customers don't see it. So I think maybe the most uh, interesting point of comparison would be what would you have to do to do what we do if you started doing it with Docker right now? And you'd have to do an enormous amount. Even if you use Docker Cloud, you'd have so many responsibilities in terms of structuring your application, in terms of picking your Docker images and maintaining them in some way. Um, and you know, owning security models and all of that. Whereas with uh, platform, we hide all of that. The, um, the level of abstraction that you think at when you're using Docker is a container uh, and you look upwards towards the application, you look downwards towards the infrastructure and you've got this like middle of the stack view. It's a very low level view. When you work with platform, you have the point of view of a developer who thinks about an application and everything's below you. Okay, everything's out of sight, hopefully. All you have to do on platform is say, I want my SQL, I want Redis, I want Solar. And I want these mount points, and these are my redirects, and some other details. And then you put your code in, and it runs. So the fact that we use containerization is actually invisible to you. And uh, I mean, in terms of performance and scalability, um, well, uh, we, when, when we need to scale really big anyway, we currently don't even use containers to do it. We use full instances, and we can run sites uh, from six CPUs for one site to hundreds of CPUs for one site. And we can go up and down between those two levels without taking the site offline. And we do that without Docker or containers. So these details, these implementation details uh, are not always the most important thing to focus on. We use Docker in a, in a couple uh, cases in uh, our product. Uh, we use it for our own CI process, and we also use Docker to simulate various um, deployment strategies um, for our enterprise sites so that we can like mimic the deployment process that a standard site has and then deploy that onto an enterprise site. 
So we use Docker, but uh, we don't depend on Docker or containers for the very high levels of scalability. Uh, and as a customer, you don't see the containerization level anyway. Not yet, but it's clearly on our list, as well as .NET. Now that Microsoft is making it so you can run SQL Server on Linux, that looks very attractive. Um, but yeah, maybe that's something for 2017. It's not been completely decided when that's the highest priority, but it's, it's not available yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Regarding uh, British Council, uh, from what I understand, there was a multi-site uh, of a single uh, root installation. Yeah. And you had to configure to, to customize each uh, country, if I'm correct. So um, right now with the platform, do you have any base code where you add up functionality or customization or you know, remove elements, I don't know, Exactly. Yeah, so the base code would be inside the, the Solas uh, Drupal installation profile, um, which is held at GitHub. So they make all the um, new modules and the changes there, and then uh, the make files that Robert uh, talked about in each of the country sites, then pull in the um, installation profile code base and put it into each of the countries. And then each of the country repositories have got any custom bits like their custom theme, uh, color changes, any imagery um, is stored there separately. Yeah, so that's the make process, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, last question. Uh, you mentioned about that uh, the cloning of the environment uh, is, is done on the fly, and the interpretation of the environment is also created on the fly. And you also mentioned about the build time for the regular build, you put it down to the time right around 35 minutes or 40 minutes. Hmm. So uh, the cloning is, is uh, of the environment So what was the second question? Uh, reversing in the production environment uh, to copying it to, you know, making, a, uh, making it available to the day or day. Ah, yeah. Something uh, sure. different than the sync uh, workflow is being implemented. Sure. So we, we basically have two tools um, for, for people. Uh, one, you can make a new clone. Uh, it's actually a Git branch. So the, the fundamental idea of platform is if you make a NuGet branch, you get an entire site. Okay, and you get that really fast, and it synchronizes the data from a parent branch, um, a master, for example. Okay, so that's one functionality that you have available is the creation of an environment with a new copy of data. Depending on a number of factors, uh, that takes in practice usually from 90 seconds to three or four minutes. Um, that's not very much dependent on how much data there is because of the file system technologies that we use underneath. Um, that's much more dependent simply on like how busy the server is, <laughs> really. <laughs> that's usually the main factor. Um, so, and, and that's one of our actual killer features. That means that I can, uh, if I need to roll out a hot fix, I push, I push a button, Three minutes later, I've got a new version of the site to test on. I deploy my hotfix. I make sure everything's fine. I push merge. Three minutes later, everything's deployed. So it's, and I don't have to disrupt anybody else's workflow. And I know that I've tested it on something that is an identical copy to production, bit by bit. Um, the other thing that we do is simply a pure data synchronization. And that's the same thing, only without a new code deployment. So uh, it basically, uh, a data synchronization will start by throwing away your data on the current environment, it just trashes it, and it does a new, very fast copy of the data from the parent environment into, say, dev or stage, and then you have that data available. And because of the file system technologies that we use, even if it's hundreds of gigabytes, that's gonna take a couple of minutes. If you compare that to a MySQL dump, MySQL import, a re-index of your solar, and an rsync of your uploaded files, then you're 
got a big smile on your face because you know you just saved a lot of time. So and, and when you say the balance sums, is, is that if you, you are paid, paid or if you yeah. Can, so you, you can basically select from which loan you want? Yeah, so one thing that Platform does that's, um, so we implemented our own Git. Okay, you use Git not like normal, but when you use Git, you're running a Git that we built. And one of the things that the Git that we built does that other Gits don't do is that it tracks a hierarchy between the branches. So, and you see that visually in the platform UI. So by default, the platform, new branches on platform are going to take their data from uh, a parent <coughs> because there's a hierarchy that you see, okay? And if, if you don't specify a hierarchy, if you just like push a Git branch to platform, then it will have the master branch as the parent and then it'll get its data from there. Good. Any qu other questions? We've probably got time for one more. Um, so uh, Alexis mentioned that the point in time and downtime has gone from four hours to an hour and a half. Um, Mike, you mentioned that you got it down to 35 minutes. Yeah. Um, those sound like scarily high numbers for downtime. Is that actually just the deployment time when you know, downtime is second? Because I use platform, I know downtime is uh, yeah. non existent. It is, yeah, so it was, it was 126 sites, so each one was down for the minute whilst it was a dip, the rebuild, and then it was 35 minutes to work its way through the, the whole so series of projects. No, 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 no. No, no. Thank you. <laughs> right, okay, I think we've run out of time, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, <laughs> We've, we've got a case study which the British Council approved today, so that'll be on our site in a few days. Um, there's about seven of the pictures people here. There's about ten of us. We've got a stand and you walk into the office at home with light. We're back to back with Acquia. Normally we're toe to toe, we're back to back. Uh, downstairs, please come and see us. Thanks very much.